I want you to turn. I'm going to talk today about something that I hope it's encouraging. I came here to encourage you. And if I give you a simple and non-religious definition of encouragement, encouragement would be words or actions. This is Adam Levecki de definition here. Encouragement would be words or actions that get people past where they are into where God has them to be. So if your journey, let's say, has 987 steps and you're on step 203, a word of encouragement or an act of encouragement should simply push you to step 284. Encouragement is about giving people insight into moving forward with God. And so in, in, in reality, our faith in this world is tested. And today I want to talk about the testing of your faith, the trial of your faith. I want to talk about what God is producing in your life. And I want to, want to kind of almost unveil or reveal a mystery that is, is a... Have you ever read a verse in the Bible and you're like, that's kind of scary? You know? Well, there's one that's real scary and it's Matthew 7 where there's this guy who calls him, you know, Jesus Lord, Lord. And he says, you know, I don't, you know... Don't call me Lord, Lord, if you don't do what I'm saying. That's what it says in Luke. But in Matthew, it says, um, Jesus is, is very clear. He says that he that does the will of my Father, um, not everyone says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father. That's radical. That doesn't mean we're saved by works. It means salvation is a work. Matthew 25, Jesus said, you know, I was hungry, you fed me. The other guy said, you know, when didn't we not feed you? The point of that scripture is not that we're saved by giving food to people. The point is that when we're saved, we have a concern to give food to people. It's not that we work for salvation. It's that we work from it. A lot of people do not know that they know what they're saved from. They don't know what they're saved for. And so I want to encourage you that you're saved to heal the sick. You're saved to preach the gospel to the poor. You're saved to be an encouragement to your brother and sister, this person next to you. You're saved to help others move forward in their relationship with Jesus and in their purpose on the earth. Does that make sense? And so then in verse 23, it says, And then I will profess, this is Matthew 7, And I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. And let me explain it like this. Sin stops us from knowing God. Iniquity stops God from knowing us. And so, here's, here's what it says. I want, you to, I want to continue with me. It says, Therefore, whoever, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which has built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, that people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And so when Jesus spoke, there was a line of demarcation. And what was clear is that when he was speaking, there was authority upon his words. And what's interesting here about this word astonished in Greek, it actually means that they were struck to heart. And it, it's actually a visual picture. If, if, if like, almost like if you're walking and, and someone hits you and you go like that, well, that's how they felt on the inside and they had an inner witness that what he's saying is true and it must be listened to and so this is a very interesting thing because before that it talks about um, 
you know, false prophets. It talks about a, a good tree. It's a, it's a very interesting, uh, it's, very, it's a really intense portion of Scripture. And so I'm like, and then, it, and then you know, it says if you continue, if you, if you go before that, it says that, you know, didn't we cast out demons? Um, we prophesied. We went to like the prophetic school. Um, we've done many wonderful works. That word wonderful there in Greek is dunamis. I mean, that's, a, that, that's power. I mean, that's from God. It's, it's a very interesting thing how God can use something or use someone and not know who they are. God blessed Esau. But God said to Abraham, give me your only son, Isaac. See, God can bless something that he doesn't recognize. Anyway, that's another story. All right, what, what I want to say with here is this. This is very interesting because what happens here is this is a very pivotal portion of Scripture. You have people who have sound doctrine. They're Pentecostal. They're charismatic. They believe in the power of God. They probably speak in tongues. Um, and they can even communicate the lordship of Jesus to other people. The only danger is it's just not true for them. See, in Luke 6, it says, Many will say, Lord, Lord. Another person, he has correct doctrine, except his lifestyle is not in agreement with his life, with his doctrine. And to walk in truth, our lifestyle must be in agreement with our doctrine. It's not enough to say, I believe in healing. We need to pray for the sick. It's not enough to pray for the sick. We need to live godly in Christ Jesus. D do you understand? God is looking for us to be whole, mature Christians. And so I began to ask the Lord. I said, Lord, you've got to show me in your word what's the deal with this because this is a pretty intense portion of Scripture. It's clear that healing is for today. It's clear that you want to heal people. It's clear, it's clear that you love people and you want people to be free from the devil, which is why you came to the earth to destroy the works of the devil. So there's no question that God wants us to prophesy. God wants us to, to minister to people. So I began to say, God, I, you know, can you explain this to me? Because I really want to understand this because this is a really, uh, you know, very serious portion of Scripture to people who take the Word of God correctly. And so he, he, the Lord just, you know, led me. I don't know how He led me, maybe through concordance. <laughs> but He led me to Luke 6 and, I, and God gave me understanding of this Scripture. And here's what I want to say. I want to, I want to give you this encouraging prophetic word that... There's a storm coming to your house and mine. And it's to test the house. And um, that's not a very encouraging word, especially for people who are going through stuff. But I want to actually encourage you, and I want to use this to encourage you. Um, if you go into Luke 6 and you go into verse, uh, let's go into verse 45. It says, A good man bringeth forth treasure, out of his heart forth for what is good and an evil man out of his out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks and why call ye me Lord Lord and do not the things which I say I want you to listen very carefully right now and whatso whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them I will show you whom he is like he is like a man which built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the floods arose and the stream beat vehemently, heavily, upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. And he that heareth these and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently or heavily and immediately it fell and great. And the ruin of the house was great. And so I read that and it's like, it seems so simple. It's like one guy obeys and one guy doesn't obey. And the guy who obeys is building his house on a rock. But the guy who, you know, disobeys and he doesn't build wisely, the pressures of life cause his, his, his whole structure to cave. And so I said like, you know, is, is it that simple as obeying? Is that really what it comes down to? And the Lord said, yeah, but it's not just that. And I go, what's that? And he said to me, read this very carefully. And I went back and I read it very carefully. And when I read it, 
in verse 47, you know, you know how it starts? It's so, it says this in the King James. It says, whoever cometh to me. See, the difference between the man who built his house on the rock is the man kept coming to the Lord. Cometh is the second tense of a word. It speaks of continuum. And it means that we keep coming. And so the man who keeps coming to the Lord is strengthened in his presence and is empowered from his presence to live out that word. You see, the, guy, the other guy, he heard, but he didn't keep coming to the Lord. If you look at it, see, it's very, you have to read the Bible very carefully. I mean, I know we want to read it in Greek and in Hebrew, and I think that's wonderful, but read it in English or whatever language you speak first, and just read it real carefully, because sometimes it's right there. And, and what, I, what I found out is the man who the Lord recognizes is the man who keeps coming to him, or the woman or the child, the person that pursues the Lord, the person that keeps coming is the person who is strengthened and is the person who is empowered. And what's amazing about coming to the Lord is we don't come to bring Him really anything because He really doesn't need anything we have. As a matter of fact, we need everything He has. That's why I prayed today. We don't have much. We have a few instruments. We have a few voices. We don't really have much. But this is all we have, Lord, and we come and it's for You. And so my, 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 my encouragement to You in your life, and this is for me in my life, is we need to keep coming to Him. It doesn't matter if it's with an open Bible. It doesn't matter if it's with a guitar. It doesn't matter if you're laying down on your face, if you're sitting down, if you're driving in traffic. Lord, we just come to you right now. It's the turning of the heart, and it's the turning of the attention, and it's the turning of the affections to the Lord. And when we begin to do that, he begins to recognize us. And it's not on our merit. We can only come because the Father draws us. We can only come through His Son. We only come because the Holy Spirit is, is, is prodding us, is, nodding, you know, is leading us in that direction. But we can be stubborn and we can be insubordinate. We can be like, no, and we can resist. Or we can be poor in spirit and we can say, yes, I'm going to come. I'm going to come because I have a need. I'm going to come. I'm going to come. But when we come, yeah, we come poor. But like Bill Johnson says, we don't leave poor. We leave rich. Because the poor in spirit are rich in faith. And so when we come empty, we leave filled. And so the, the goal here and, and the reality of life is that our faith will be tested. And if you are looking to build a house that endures the storms of life, I, I encourage you, don't just come to Bible study, but come to Bible study. Don't just come to church, but come to church. But above all things, come to Him. Come to Him. Don't not pray for the sick. Do it. But just keep coming to Him. Be that person that pursues. And what's amazing is, um, He's not hiding. You know, it's not, it's not really like we're seeking anymore. Jesus declared the Father. We're spending time with someone who is revealed and wants to be, He wants to be, He wants to be approached. Paul didn't say, go and seek God, and, and he said, let's boldly approach the throne of grace. I mean, you have full access. And there's a major difference between someone who has a mindset of, I'm seeking. I, I understand the sincerity of it, and I understand the, the, the language of the Old Testament. I understand that. But Jesus came to reveal and to declare the Father, right? And so it's, it, there is already a way been made for us. And so we don't have to spend our time searching for someone who's saying, Guys, I'm right here. You can see me in Jesus. If you've seen him, you've seen me. And, and so we need, as a people, to be people that pursue the Lord. And th this, this means everything. This was the difference between Hannah having a child or not. You see, she went barren. And the barrenness in our life is supposed to produce a cry from our heart that acknowledges, apart from the Lord, we can do nothing. 
That's what it is to be poor in spirit. But when you're poor in spirit, you become rich in faith. And it's no longer, without the Lord I can do nothing. It's actually through Him. He strengthens me. I can do all things. And so we begin to grow up. And uh, I believe that that's what God is looking for. And so I want to talk a little bit more. Because Jesus, uh, He talked about the testing um, of, uh, of a house. And he, it's interesting because the rain descended this way. There was pressure from above. And then the house also received pressure on the side. And that's a very interesting picture because that's how it is. You, you, in our life, we'll receive pressure from the demonic. There'll be, there'll be literal, literal things, like demonic things. You know, like, that, and it will, like, press down on you. That's why people are heavy burdened. You ever hear someone who feels real heavy burden? That's because the demonic realm puts pressure on them. Literal pressure. That's what spirit of heaviness is. That's why some people have back trouble. It's why some, and I'm not saying all back trouble. Listen to what I'm saying. I'm not saying that. If you fall down the stairs and you have back trouble, you, you may not be the devil. You know? but, but, I mean, there's literally physical implications of the demonic. But then he, he uses other language. He said that the streams uh, came and hit against the house. And those are sometimes the natural circumstances in our life that break out against us. So we're feeling it here and we're feeling it here. It's almost like a cross. You know, the pressure from down and the pressure from the side. And the solution is what Jesus did on the tree. And the solution is arms pinned to the tree, outstretched to the world. Why? So anyone who would come would keep coming. He's not turning anyone down. Everyone's invited. Everyone who's thirsty, come. It's perfect. You don't have any money. You're invited. You come too. I mean, this is really good news. Anyway, let's go to James chapter 1. I'm going to go there, James and Peter. And um, it's interesting because these guys, they really lived what they talked about. Um, anyway James 1 um, this is a letter to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad it's talking to Christian Jews my brother encountered all joy when you fall into various trials it's interesting do you hear this joy when you fall into trials do you see that even in trials and even in tribulations we're not victims All right, watch this. My brother encountered all joy when we fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith, here it is, worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect or mature and entire, lacking nothing. This is pretty bizarre. According to what the Word of God says right here, not according to my opinion, someone who possesses patience lacks nothing. Why? Because if we're willing to wait long enough, everything we need, we will receive. And if we have the attribute and we have the character of God, because God is patient, love is patient, if we are people who are persevering, see, perseverance is patience in motion. If we are patient people, according to God's standard, according to what He sees about us, we possess everything. We're, there's no lack in our life. So you can say, well, there's a lack in my finances and, and uh, I'm late or there's a lack in my family. Just keep persevering and keep being patient because everything you need will be added unto you. And according to God's eyes, you don't lack anything. The Bible says that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What you believe about God will determine what you receive from Him and what you believe about yourself is the standard you'll live up to. You know some people have a very low expectation of themselves? And you know what they often do? They live right there. The Bible says not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. That means we should think highly of ourselves. And that's not pride. Jesus paid a, a serious price, which tells me that I'm valuable and it tells me that you're valuable. Which means we should esteem each other more highly than ourselves. Which means we should esteem others higher than ourselves. Which we should, means we should still esteem ourselves highly. Right. I'm sitting talking to a room of ambassadors. Come on. That's right. Right. Good. Amen. That's right. 
All right. So for us to possess patience, we need to pass through testing. In the kingdoms, in the kingdoms, excuse me, in the kingdom, tests are to produce fruit. God doesn't set you up with a test to give you an assessment. Do you know that? He already knows. He sets us up within a, with, a, with a test. He allows us to be tested with the intent to produce something in our life. God is always producing in our life. God is not a consumer. God is a producer. God is always, listen, please, God is always producing. Patience is necessary. This is a real good one here. If we are going to possess a healthy soul life. Jesus was talking to, uh, to the disciples in Luke 21. He was talking about the end of the age. He was talking about suffering. He was talking about persecution. He was talking about that he would give them a mouth and he would give them wisdom. He was talking about all these things. And uh, he said this. In your, possess, in your patience, possess ye your souls. Meaning... Our soul, we have a healthy soul life. We are in control of our mind, our will, and emotions through patience. In other words, let's say I have, I'll, give you my, I'll bring you into my world. Let's say I'm an itinerant preacher, right? And I go somewhere, and uh, the church doesn't show me much love. I don't think I preached a good word. Can I be honest? I didn't get a good offering. I didn't sell many books, because that's how I live also, Right? So this wasn't a good, it wasn't a good week, let's say. Is that okay? Can we say it like that? I'll bring you right into my world, right? It wasn't a good week. There was no support, and I'm thinking, what's happening? And now I look at myself, and my expenses were 600 and I took in 550 It wasn't a good week, okay? Does this make sense? Yeah. If I look at those circumstances, and I view everything in my life, through that one circumstance, I'm not looking through the lens of patience. All I'm seeing is my circumstances, and now my circumstances are dictating how I feel. Instead of me seeing, wait a minute, I remember when we didn't even do $200 a week. I remember when we had nowhere to speak. I remember when nothing was going on. And I know what God has said, and I know what He's done so far, and I know where He's going with us, and I know what He's promised. And I know the seeds that have been planted. And I know the ground is good. And I know what God is doing. And I know what God has said. And I know what He has done. And I look at things and say, I'll just wait a little bit longer. And so I look at it through patience and through hope, right? And then I'm not discouraged. And then I'm not living in my circumstances. I'm living at my circumstances. That doesn't mean I don't have circumstances. That doesn't mean I don't have trials. That doesn't mean I don't have tribulation. That doesn't mean the pressures of life are any different with me than they are with anyone else. They are. But it's how we choose to approach the circumstances. See, the Bible says that, you know, it said that Mary was someone who sat at Jesus' feet. And, and I think that that's cool. I wrote a book about it. <laughs> I think that's great. But we've even received a higher invitation than His feet. He said, sit with me on my throne. He's saying... You don't have to stare at my feet. You can look from my perspective. You can serve from an aerial view. And so that, that's a whole together different perspective. Anyway, my, my point here is that we in life, it, it doesn't matter if you're working, if you're in sales, if you're a pastor, if you're a preacher, if you're a carpenter, it doesn't matter. We are going to be tested. And l let me define what a test is. A test in our life is something that is contrary to faith. Something in our life, circumstances, that are contrary to faith. And you're saying, well, what do you mean? I'll give you an example. The Word of God declares that you're healed, but you're sick. The Word of God declares that you have enough, but your bank account doesn't show it. The word over your life saying that you're going to go to the nations, but you're waiting for an invitation. The word, and, and whatever it may be, the word of God says that you're going to be on TV, you're going to be on the radio, and you have $100 of monthly support. Whatever it may be, 
Whatever you may be going through, the word, of, the word of the Lord for your family is that your family be restored and you just were divorced. Whatever is contrary to faith, whatever is contrary to what God says in His Word, whatever is contrary to an authentic and true word from God that has been tested, whatever is contrary to that is the trial of your faith. The Bible says that the word of the Lord, what did it do? It tested Joseph. So the word, this is what the word comes with because the word is, is really interesting. The word comes with power and with provision to carry itself out because it doesn't return void. The word, but it, it, there's so much. <laughs> the word, it's really interesting. It's like when God releases a word into, into, into the earth, it has so much power and so much authority on it that as it breaks through, and goes where it, where it's where it's sent. It almost creates a vortex, like a like a vacuum. And you know what happens in a vacuum? The test comes. I don't know if I said that well. God releases His word, and His word carries on the authority on it to fulfill itself. It carries the grace to empower us to partner with it. But it also carries such authority that it will test our faith. Because the word that's released is contrary to natural logic. Do you understand? The youngest son, his whole family is going to bow down to him. Yeah, hello. Right? That makes a lot of sense. Do you understand? His father, I'm sure, loved that. You know? David, it was illegitimate. When they called him, his father didn't even recognize him as a son because he was probably conceived in adultery. Which is probably why he committed adultery, which is probably why his son committed adultery. Because he never dealt with the past. 